Welcome, welcome, Jared, Kim, all those from California. But it's good to have uh, Cammy's family here as well this morning. The mom and dad, brother, welcome. Connections everywhere. Uh, but it's good to be together, good to be in the church, good to see all of you. And um, it's always good to be in the presence of the Lord, isn't it? You can't lose. How can we lose being with the Lord? Being in the presence of the Lord, hearing His heart, hearing timely words for our lives. There's nothing better. And uh, so I want us to continue this morning. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to talk about the spiritual significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The spiritual significance. It's important that we are not religious about this day. Because Jesus never intended us to celebrate his death, death and resurrection on one day. It is a lifestyle. That's why the table of the Lord we're going to be having today is something that they enjoyed daily. And, he, and Jesus himself said, whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, do this in remembrance of me. And he's talking about the, 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 to remember his death to remember what he did in his death. But I think it's important for us to realize that it's not just a religious thing. It's not just coming to church on a Sunday and that's it. No, it's a lifestyle. This resurrection of Jesus Christ is to be celebrated every day of our lives. I think we can say amen to that. If it's just one day, what is one day? It's daily. And that's the heart of the Lord for when we look at the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his death, it just puts an appreciation in our hearts and it also opens our eyes to see what it was all about, what was the significance for our own life personally, and we can go from there. So let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. We're going to look at quite a few scriptures today, so I want you to just stay in the tunnel. But we will see and trust the Lord for the Lord to open our eyes to see the value of this death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and its significance for our lives. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So we can see in the old covenant, there was a tabernacle prepared. And that tabernacle was made specifically and uh, according to a specific pattern. And we will read that that tabernacle was prophetic about what was to come. Jesus Christ being the high priest. Because in this tabernacle that was established, the high priest was a man. And he was a man only who was allowed to go into the place which we read about, which was called the holiest of holies. So only the high priest could go in there. No one else. Only the high priest. But we will read the scriptures to see how this was prophetic of the true high priest that was to come who is going to open the door for you and I to enter into those holy of holies in our personal relationship with Jesus. No longer was it going to be a priest that could only enter into the holy of holies, but the Lord, when he died and rose from the dead, opened the door and the veil was cut in two so that the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, his church, could enter into that holy place every day of our lives. That is great news. Amen. See, that's the significance. Because in the old covenant, people couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies. And you understand why tradition has robbed people of a relationship with Christ because many are coming to the Lord through someone. 
And I understand the history of the church in the sense in the history of the old covenant days that there was a representation for the people and the high priest would go and there would be blood spilt and shed and that would be for his own sin and for the sin of the nation. But today there was one man who gave his life. Jesus Christ. One mediator. One sacrifice. Not two. One sacrifice which speaks forever. That opened the door for the church to be born and opened the door for you and I to be born again, to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, to be in relationship with Christ, and every day, every day, every day, to have access to the Holy of Holies, to the presence of God. That is a miracle. Amen. If it's religion that we see in our minds, we have this mysterious um, concept of God. But there's nothing mysterious about Jesus. He was simple. And there's a way that has been opened, which we're going to read about in the scriptures, that we can come to the Lord every day in freedom, with our hearts, with gratitude to meet Jesus in a personal way. And that's what religion doesn't do. Religion hides you from God. Religion blocks your relationship with the Lord. Because it's religion. You just do what you need to do. But relationship is something different. So that's the spirit. That's the background. That's, that's, the, that's the tabernacle that was formed. That's how it was formed. But there was prophecy to come where we were going to see now the true high priest that was going to lay his life down as a sacrifice once and for all. Beautiful. Verse 6. No, thank you. <laughs> Amen. You see, even the children cry out. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful now when these things had been thus prepared the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the service but into the second part the high priest went alone once a year can you imagine that once a year that was tough not without blood which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. I think that's clear, isn't it? There was no way while the first tabernacle was standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and various fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but Christ came. That's the big but here now. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Isn't that beautiful? Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That opened the door for your redemption. That sacrifice opened the door for you and I to be born again today, for you and I to be redeemed. And there was only one way for you and I to be redeemed, not two ways, not up four different ways up the mountain. One way, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we acknowledge He gave His life for us. We acknowledge He redeemed us by His precious blood. And when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. The old man is dead and the new man has been resurrected. That's what took place when Jesus died. That's amazing. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the puring of the flesh. That's how it was in the old covenant. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. 
for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Brothers, the good news is it's not just being born again and having the Spirit of God in us. The Bible says there is an inheritance for us that is waiting for us. That inheritance is ours. It's not if, but it's ours. When you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a child of God. To be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of condemnation that floods Christians today. Am I saved? Will I go to heaven? I'm asking you one question. Did you surrender your life to Jesus? Yes, I did. Did you acknowledge that you were a sinner? Yes, I did. Did you offer your life to the Lord? Yes, I did. Then, brother, you are born again. What your mind tells you, what people tell you, how the devil lies to you, brother, you are saved by God's grace. You are redeemed. And to be absent from your body when you die one day is to be with the presence of the Lord. And that is our inheritance. Don't allow the devil to deceive you. Don't allow to religion to rob you that you've got to go back to works to earn this salvation. Your salvation had nothing to do with works. You were saved by grace through faith. Amen? That's the gospel. Let's continue to Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 10. We'll have to just summarize things. There's so much depth you can appreciate in the book of Hebrews. I mean, people study this in Bible school for months. So we're not going to all get this done in one, one hour here. I'm just summarizing a few things. But I think it's important you just catch the spirit of it. We're talking about the significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when we share the table of the Lord today, we have a new appreciation and a new revelation in our heart what this table is all about. Not religion, not just doing it just to eat and drink and, you know, in a religious, mystical way. This is reality of life, but we'll get to that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now I want you to understand something. That when you came to Jesus Christ, you were washed by His blood. Never ever is your past life ever going to be recorded. How you lived before you came to know Jesus Christ will never ever be recorded. And I struggled with that because I had a background where, you know, you've got to do something to gain some favor from God. And when I came into marriage with Brenda, she had served the Lord from the age of four. As many of you know her, she was born again. She had lived her life in the church. She had separated her life in the church. Unfortunately, I was not like that. I was a worldly man for many years of my life, going to church, looking good on the outside. But I was living the life of a sinner. But when I was born again and the Lord washed me, I was just like the peace of God came to my heart and I, and I, I knew my, something had changed. But, and now what happened was I entered into this relationship with Brenda and because I was so sincere, I wanted to tell her all about the bad things that I had done. <laughs> because, you know, you want to be clear. Going into marriage, sometimes I tell you, you need to be clear. And I was going to just bring a whole lot of rubbish from my past because I, I really wanted her to be clear about my past life. And I remember the day when I was about to do that, it was like the Lord stopped me. He restrained me because you have the Holy Spirit in you to restrain you, don't we? And you just know, and the Holy Spirit was saying to me, your past is buried. Yes. I said, what? Oh. Because I was afraid to tell her about my, my past. Anyway, I thought she'd give me the boot. You know what I'm saying? Because your past is not exactly a nice part of your life. And the Lord said, you don't have to dig up your past. This is a new day. This is a new relationship. This is a new beginning. Go forward. Look forward. And I'll tell you what, it just took all that pressure of me and I could just enter into that marriage and look forward and never look back. But the good part about it, brothers and sisters, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't stop the day you were born again. Amen. That's what we need to know by revelation today. The significance of his resurrection is not one off for you. 
It's not a one-off cleansing. It's not a one-off, you know, sanctification. No, it is a, a, a resurrected life that opened the door for you to be reconciled to the Lord every day of your life. Because Jesus knew that you and I would fall. But in our falling, there's an advocate. There's an intercessor. Isn't that beautiful? When you talk about intercessor, and you know, if you really look in Hebrews, brothers and sisters, when you're so hard on yourself, and you so condemn yourself, and you so beat yourself up, and you can't do this, and you're so useless, there's an advocate. There's an intercessor for you. Read about it. Who, and the Bible says he even sympathizes with your weaknesses. How's that? He sympathizes. He's with you. He's bearing with you. He's not discarding you. He's not disqualifying you. He's not saying, you know, this one's better and this one's good. No, he's there to restore you. All he's looking for is what? A simple, repentant heart. And again, we see how the, uh, that, that prayer has become a religious again. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That's in the Bible. But the spirit of that, isn't it beautiful? Forgive me, Lord, every day. Again, it's not a religious prayer. It's a lifestyle. And you see, that's what religion has done to the church. It's, tra it's traditionalized the church. It's robbed the church of the significance of what the true meaning of resurrection is, of what the true meaning of this death and resurrection of Jesus is. Because we just see it in this mystical religious way. It's not mystical. It's not religious. It's the gospel. Simple. Brings you to the Lord. And we read further on. Look, look how we can come to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10. I love this. And I always go to this when my mind starts playing games and I feel condemned. And Lord, you, surely you can't forgive me again. Have you ever been down that road? Sometimes I'm saying, Lord, oh, I'm embarrassed to come to you again. You can't forgive me. And I've got to come back to the scriptures every time. Because the lies of the devil will tell you. you there's a limit to your forgiveness. You even believe that about yourself. But look what the scriptures say. Therefore, brethren, isn't this beautiful? Having boldness. Now, this is what resurrection is all about. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See, the way we come now into the presence of God, into the holy of holies, is through the blood of Jesus. <laughs> That speaks loudly today. It will never stop speaking. That blood speaks every day. It speaks of God's forgiveness the day you were born again. It speaks of God's forgiveness the day you fall, the hour you fall, the minute you fall, the, the days you've run away and backslid from the Lord. Maybe you're here today, you've, you've run away from God, but this is the day for you to feel God's heart for you. He never wrote you off. He never just discarded you. That was not his heart. That's why he gave the parable of the prodigal son and the father. He, he, it broke the father to release his son. But who's waiting for the son to return? The father. Who's celebrating the day that his son comes home and the other brother is whinging and whining? You've never done this for me. He said, what are you doing? The son of mine was lost, but now he's found. We're going to celebrate today. The heart of the Lord to restore, to forgive. Isn't that beautiful? You see, that covenant that we're going to celebrate today, when Jesus said, celebrate the new covenant, that covenant speaks of not only the forgiveness and the grace of God, but the heart of God for you. You've been damaged. All of us have been damaged. All of us have been put down. All of us have been rejected in some way. All of us have been misunderstood. All of us have had our times where, where we felt not understood and, and there's been reactions and hurts and disappointments. But we need to see in the spirit, that's not the heart of the Lord. He loves you. He'll never ever leave you or forsake you. Man can forsake you. Your mother can forsake you. Your own natural family can forsake you. Even your church family can throw you out of the church. But the Lord will never forsake his people. And I tell you what, the same heart that the father had for the son to return is the same heart of grace that the Lord wants to bring in all of our lives in his church. Because 
that world out there, not only a Christian world, but those people that don't know Jesus out there, they need that heart of grace which the Lord is forming in us, which, let me tell you, opens the door for people to see Jesus. The letter in our lives kills people. The judgment, the criticism, the pride that we're better than people, we're better than our dad because he doesn't know the Lord, we're better than our boss, he's on his third marriage, and we think we're better than him. We're only saved by the grace of God. He needs the Lord. Whether he's on his third marriage or fourth marriage, it doesn't matter. Jesus can meet him. And if it's at the last hour of the day, you're going to be in heaven with him. And that shocked that parable. You know, when they're all working in the vineyard and the guys started working at nine. And the guys started working at the last hour of the day. Can you imagine? You're working for the Lord. You're serving Jesus. You've been faithful. Nine o'clock in the morning, you've given your life, and you're working all day in the toiling sun. Someone comes in the afternoon, and he gets the same reward as you, the same wage. That defies all logic. Because if you've worked all day, and someone comes at the last hour, what's the natural logic? You should get paid more than him but not the heart of the Lord. Whether you come into the kingdom in the last hour, in fact, you remember the thief that was on the cross? <laughs> it was the last minute. And Jesus said to him, what? Today you will be with me in paradise. The last hour or the last minute. That's why the challenge, brothers and sisters, is to see the significance of this that Jesus never gives up on anyone. And the heart of the Lord that he wants to form in you and to form in me, that you and I never give up on anyone. You can't draw a line on people. And if you've drawn the line, the way back is simple. Lord, forgive me. I've drawn the line. It's enough. I'm not going to forgive anymore. I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I've drawn a line. It's enough. But it was never enough for the Lord. Never. And that's why he wants a heart in his church. And the heart comes in the church by the gospel. And the gospel is painful because it deals with the intents and thoughts and attitudes of our heart. You sit in church and you see, I'm legalistic. We're sitting under the gospel and seeing that I'm proud, I'm better, I'm judgmental, I'm critical. But the gospel brings us back to the Lord. And again, the blood speaks. Because I can come to the Lord at any time during the meetings. Sometimes I'm sitting under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the meeting, and uh, I, I'm saying to the Lord, forgive me. I'm not waiting until the end. I'm listening to the gospel, and I'm saying, Lord, Thank you, Jesus. I'm sitting in here. I'm, I'm listening to your voice, Lord. Just forgive me. I don't have to get religious about at the end of the meeting putting my heart right. I know when my heart is not right and I can be sitting in a meeting like this and I'm saying, Lord, thank you. You're bringing reality to me. You're bringing conviction to my heart. You're bringing the gospel. I love this gospel. It's painful. But I know this gospel has the power to change my life. And that's why we're in church, to hear from God. And I tell you when, you, when you allow the Lord to form that heart of grace in you, you see people differently. To the pure, all things are pure. You go back to work, you see the boss differently. You go back to the husband, he's not even interested in church. You see him differently. Your son that's run away from God or was born again many years ago, or your child, or whatever circumstance, whatever you see with your natural eyes, God brings you to have a heart and say, Lord, oh, Nothing's bigger, nothing's impossible for you. Nothing's too, just, nothing is impossible for you to overturn and turn around for good. So, we see there, and we continue to read, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is flesh, that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I love that. That scripture has so encouraged me so many times in my life where I've just felt, Lord, surely a line must be drawn. And I just come back to that revelation. And, and the other one that I always talk to you about is the one in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Isn't it beautiful that in that holy of holies, in the presence of the Lord, we can find His grace, His mercy in our time of need. And we can start again, whether it's at 9 o'clock, whether it's at 10 o'clock, as Brenda said, whether it's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, whether whatever time, whatever hour, when there's that reconciliation, that restoration, that forgiveness, we can just look for it. No more condemnation, no beating yourself up. Maybe people still want to remind you of yesterday and still want to beat you up. You've got to come back to the word of the Lord and realize that God has forgiven you. And I want to encourage you, just listen to this one. Every sin that you repent of, there is never, ever a record of that ever again. Every sin. Never a record. Man can record. And you know, it's amazing how people go back five years and remind you and remind me of what you did. Yes, we were in the flesh. Yes, what we said was wrong. But in that place... We found the Lord. We found His forgiveness. We also ask for forgiveness. But there are some today that refuse to forgive and hold you ransom until till the end. But the Lord doesn't hold you ransom. You're washed clean. Never a record. Man can record. And there are many recorders. <laughs> many. Still have records. But when the blood of Jesus Christ has washed your heart, you are clean. The Bible says your sin is removed as far as the east is from the west. You are declared the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And that simply means it's as though you have not sinned. When I was born again and was declared the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, my whole past was buried and done with and washed. It was though it never existed. It was never there. It was forgiven. It was washed. It never was there. Finished. And it's the same. In your daily sanctification. Because it's not just one day when you were born again. It's every day how the Lord is working and forming. And anyway, repentance is a good sign that we're growing. If we can't remember when we repented last, we have to question a few things. I mean, we have to do that, guys. I know exactly when I repented. It wasn't too long ago. Just a little attitude comes in here, a little irritation here, something that's just not right, it's not sting well. Oh, Lord, where did that come from? Forgive me. But in that repentance, we're changing. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, the challenge today of what we see in the scriptures, Jesus has made a way. For us to build that relationship with him. And that's what we're living for. Don't live for anything else. Jesus said, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. That is your priority. It's not religion, doing things in church, going there, being this, doing that. Your priority above everything. And that's what was on my heart today. There's so many facets to the resurrection and to the death of Jesus. But for me, what was strong in my heart was his desire to walk with you, like he walked with Adam in the garden. His desire to know you. His desire to know your heart. You think, well, Lord, you know my heart, but does he know you? Many have prophesied in my name. Many have done this. Many have done that. But I never knew you. The way he wants, he's not talking about he doesn't know us. He knows every hair on our head. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. He's looking for a heart. Lord, I'm reaching for you. I'm entering into the Holy of Holies. I want this relationship to grow. Lord, help me. Forgive me. Strengthen me, Lord. I love you. Today, the Bible says the love of most in the last days will grow cold. That means the relationship with Jesus has grown cold because we've become religious. Religion doesn't bring us into relationship with Christ. Religion brings us back to works. We go to church to please God. We read the Bible to please God. We pray to please God. We do this to please God. But we are not connected in our heart. As we know in a marriage, you can do everything for your wife. You can provide for her. You can buy her the best car. You can give her what she wants. You can do this. You can do that. But if there's no connection in the heart, what have we got? 
What have we got? That's why for Brenda and I, it's a priority. Times where we just get on a, you know, busy. life is busy, guys. Could we agree with that? Life is busy. Thank God one day we're going to be in heaven with Jesus and, oh, it's going to be wonderful being with him. But while we're on this earth, it's busy. But in that busyness, the Lord needs to fill my heart. And it's not now religion. One hour a day, this time, if it's one hour a day and there's freedom in that, not, not decrying your one hour a day. But for many people, one hour a day is religion. They've done their job and that's it. But what about the day? What about the day where you, Lord, I can't cope with this any longer. I'm at work. What's happening? The overload of work and situations in my home and with my children and my kids and all the rest of it. Where's the Lord in this now? Lord, help me. Give me grace. I can't. I mean, this week, uh, I, I wasn't in home group on Thursday because I had uh, food poisoning. I tell you, I didn't expect that that morning. But I went there and I joined uh, uh, Rod and, and, and uh, Nick and, and Keith and I were having some breakfast together. They didn't order what I had ordered. So I'm really sorry I didn't follow them. But when I left that place, I said, doesn't this, something doesn't fit well here. I sit well here. And I want to tell you, the whole day I was like in bad shape. Until eventually the afternoon, all that, I mean, the, you know, what comes with it. <laughs> Eesh, it was terrible. Fever at night, I was struggling. Or, and, but in the midst of that, I'm just saying, Lord, please help me. I'm, I'm cooked here. I really mean that. I mean, the Lord knows that in that situation, I didn't go through that without him. And you know, there's things that go on in your body that you don't expect. Guys, we have to be honest about that. And you're like saying, Lord, please help me. I can't cope with this. And um, it was just, Lord, please, this is terrible. But I'm so glad that I went through those situations with him. I'm literally, because we're driving for about an hour and I'm lying in the car off and just, and the sun baking in my head, oh, I can't, couldn't get the sun in my head. I'm just miserable. I'm saying, Lord, help me. And I want to tell you, he did help me. And uh, I felt a lot stronger and I'm preaching the gospel today. But it hasn't been particularly easy. Yesterday was probably the first day of recovery in whatever, in one sense. But then... Last night, I mean, I went down at 5 o'clock and was done. But I'm thinking about today, and I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm t petrified, guys. just want to be, open my heart to you here. I've got responsibility here, standing in front of you. You're looking at me today. I'm saying, Lord, I'm petrified. I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, Lord. I'm honestly going to bed. And, and she knows my heart. I'm waking up at 4 in the morning. But in those moments of waking up at four in the morning, in those moments of, I'm saying, Lord, help me. And I want to tell you, the Lord answers those prayers. And I can say one thing this morning, standing in front of you, sharing the gospel in front of you, I can take not one ounce of credit for what has happened today. Because I know that the Lord has heard my cry and my need for my help, my need of Him, His grace, His ability, His whatever I need today. And I know as I'm staring at you and in front of you and in the presence of the Lord, my God, my Lord and Savior who I love and cherish with all my heart, I know one thing, that when I get in my car and I drove, drive home, I can say one thing, thank you, Jesus, to you be the glory. So He's there for you. He's not distant from you.